to turn to the book of First Samuel. I'm going to read from First Samuel, chapter 17, in verses 56 through 58. The king said, this is King Saul, find out whose son this young man is. As soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul, with David still holding the Philistine's head. So you got to see this. He's got Goliath's head in his hand. And Saul uh, asked him, Whose son are you, young man? And David said, I am the son of your servant Jesse of Bethlehem. I want to preach from the subject, Undeclared Anointing. Nothing is asked about the anointing. Nothing is said. Let's ask God's blessing upon his word. We love and thank you, Jesus, for the power of your spirit, and we pray that the mighty hand of God would be with us in this service today. Bless and anoint is our prayer in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Smile at somebody. Shake their hand. Greet them. Let them know that you're still alive. All I can say, of course, this is the consummation of the great story of David's triumph over that beast of a man by the name of Goliath, tormented and challenged Saul's soldiers to a representative battle day after day. But there were no takers until this young man who was anointed in secret steps out into the arena of public battle and now feels the pulse within his vein to take on this monstrous challenge even though all of Saul's seasoned soldiers cowered. But just because everybody else is afraid doesn't mean you need to be afraid. I believe that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. And David had to deal with the spirit of Saul both before and after the conquest of Goliath. The devil doesn't care. The devil hates you before you win, and he hates you after you win. And before you win, he'll try to load you down to prevent you from achieving victory. And if you manage to sidestep Saul's tactics of loading you up with armor that didn't work for him, thinking that now it's going to work for you. And you take on Goliath and bring him down. Then after the victory's over, he has another interview. He wants to talk to you some more. Turn to your neighbor and say, beware of the spirit of Saul. The spirit of Saul will ask you who your daddy is. And in so doing, he'll try to naturalize you. Right? He doesn't want to know about, he, he, he's not interested in identifying or you rehearsing your spiritual pedigree. He wants to keep you in the flesh. He wants to bring you back to your fleshly origins. He will try to get your attention off of your anointing and bring you back to that dysfunctional world. Who's your daddy? 
How could David not feel the pain growing up in a house with seven brothers who overlooked him with a daddy who didn't think about him when the prophet Samuel came to do some anointing? He was the last man on anybody's mind. And so to remind him, who is your daddy, young man? He was taking him back, perhaps, to the land of pain. Here he is standing with the evidence of a power greater than any that Saul or his soldiers had. He's got the head of Goliath in his hand, and he's trying to bring him back to this place of sibling rivalries, of forgotten and ignored uh, celebrations when the prophet came to anoint, talking about who sired you when the real story is, who anointed you, boy? Praise God. Don't let the devil bring you back to who you were. Don't let him talk about your progeny and ignore your destiny. Don't forget this. Amen. How we were born. The circumstances of our birth aren't even worth recollecting when you compare it to the destiny that we inherited when God filled you with the Holy Ghost. You got the head of a giant in your hand. Hallelujah. Don't let the spirit of Saul show you who you're not. Let him have to acknowledge who you are. It's time to declare that I'm a child of the king. Hallelujah. Come on, I am a child of destiny because I've got an anointing. Amen, amen. What, what Saul really wants to know is how did you pull this off? Well, it's time to let the devil know. It is not, it, in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, but I know somebody. In myself I can't, but I got a friend who can. And I feel that power of that anointing working in my life today. Talking about my man Mahomes like that. Did you read about those guys making fun of his dad bod? First of all, don't be taking your shirt off unless you got really something to show, I guess. So I guess he takes his shirt off and they start making fun of him, calling him having a man bod. Well, let me tell you something. When you got a rocket launcher for an arm, who cares what your belly's doing? Everybody's always trying to get their eyes off of what's working and what's not, and, and off of what works and onto what doesn't work. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. I feel this in the Holy Ghost. The devil wants to put your focus on what you can't do, who you can't be, what didn't happen, where the pain came from, when the fact of the matter, you got the head of a giant in your hand because there's power in the name of Jesus. You wouldn't be here with a shout on your lips and a spring in your step had it not been for the oil of anointing that was poured on your head the day you got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Every child of destiny, every anointed son and daughter of God are going to have to meet the Philistines. Not just once, but probably over and over Again, listen to what it says in verse number one of the chapter that we read. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soko in Judah. Everybody say in Judah. And they pitched camp at Ephes Damim in Judah. That means praise. At, and Ephes Damim means at the border of blood. So they first encountered the Philistines where hell seeks to dampen your praise by preventing you from accessing the blood. <laughs> At the border, what side of the, you know what, you can determine what kind of a worshiper you are this morning by what side of the blood you're on. If you're on this side of the blood where you're depending upon your own strengths and goodness, good luck. You got to get on the other side of the blood. 
you got to apply the blood of Jesus Christ to every part of your mind, body, soul, and spirit if you're going to enter into the glory realm. Hello? The mission of the Old Testament priest was to carry the blood, and the objective was to carry the blood all the way till you make a touchdown on the other side of the veil in the presence of the glory of God. Oh, hallelujah. I want the blood of Jesus not just to relieve me, but I want the blood of Jesus to bring me into a place of divine anointing and power with God. Don't let the devil prevent you from accessing the blood of Jesus or he'll kill the spirit of worship in you. Come on, somebody. I'm in the house of God. I might as well get in the spirit of praise. But if I'm going to get in the spirit of praise, I'm going to need some help up in here. I'm going to have to apply the blood of Jesus because I'm not worthy to praise him, not good enough to praise him. Amen. But through the blood of Jesus, I can. Amen. And so Saul's army, they were positioned for defeat, while David, lone David, was positioned for victory. Verse verse 3, the Philistines occupied one hill and Israelites the other, with a valley between them. Verse 16, and for 40 days the Philistine came forward every morning and took his stand and blathered and blasphemed and insulted and defied the God of heaven, not for one day, but for 40 days, every day. Can I tell you something? Israel positioned themselves for defeat when they remained mute in the presence of a blasphemous blasphemous giant who verbally abused them day after day after day and offered no reply. And so I have a word for somebody who's literally been a victim of demonic verbal abuse. Quit allowing the devil to talk to you like that. Don't just stand there and take it day after day after day, but you got to rise up and you got to say, amen, I know who I serve and I am persuaded that he's able, I'm not able, but he's able to keep that which I have committed to him. Somebody needs to fight back, hallelujah. And you fight back by declaring you're an anointed child of God. And so there's research that in child, in the case of children, verbal abuse can literally change the way their brain develops. If a child is subjected to intimidating, demeaning uh, declarations over and over, especially from the people that are supposed to be their protectors and their caregivers, it does immense and lasting damage to their spirits and to their personalities. Because built into the parent, child, or teacher, student relationship, or whatever it might be, is this power that that the others have over others that if they are called names, if they are demeaned in such a way, it can be devastating to them. That is why the devil wants to call you names. He called Jesus names. He called Jesus a glutton and a wine-bibber. I don't ever see where Jesus practiced gluttony not one time. There's been a time or two when I've practiced some gluttony, and I I have to admit. He called him, uh, through the voice of his critics, casting out devils by the prince of devils, Beelzebub. It's time to reposition ourselves today. Jesus never allowed he, he to be in, Jesus never allowed himself to be insulted without a comeback, 
Oh, hallelujah. I want you to notice David's victory began not in his hand, not in his pouch, not in his sling, but on his lips. Verse 22, David left his things with the keeper of supplies and ran to the battle lines and asked his brothers how they were doing. And as he was talking with them, the Goliath from Gath steps out and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. And whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. Then David kept on talking. Hey, what's the reward for the person that takes out this loudmouth giant out here? And his brother tried to silence him. Oh, my. Some of you don't need a giant to quieten you down. Your brother or sister will do it in a minute if you give them half a chance. Come on. Don't ever make fun of the way somebody shouts at church. Because if you stop them from worshiping because of a critic or a joke or a side remark, you might, you might bring the judgment of God upon your own self. Worship is beautiful, whatever form it takes, as long as it's in the spirit. Now, if you're doing it in the flesh, we'll call you out. But if it's in the spirit and in the heart full of love for God, amen, practically anything goes except hurting other people and hurting yourself. Amen? But, but his brother tried to shush him down. And verse 29, then David said, now what have I done? Can't I even speak? Turn to your neighbor and say, can't I say something? Now turn to somebody else and say, yes, you most certainly can. So here's what the word of the Lord says. Speak up till hell shuts up. Speak up till hell shuts up. Say something till the devil's tongue is tied. And of course... He speaks up, and when you open your mouth, you open the arsenal of heaven. So Saul calls David over. Who is this young man, and what does he want? And Saul begins to try to shut David up too. But David won't, people who speak up won't shut up. But if you shut up, Saul will speak up and discourage you right then and there. So David speaks up and opens his mouth. I'm talking about declaring your anointing. He speaks up and speaks of past victories. When the devil is trying to shut you down, open your mouth and remind him of your bear and your lion attack. Remind him that this isn't my first uh, rodeo. There have been time. No one was looking. Nobody applauded me. I was all by myself. And sometimes the greatest victories you'll ever fight are the victories that you win all by yourself. But a lion and a bear came out, and I took them on. And that same power that I had to take, I'm feeling it now. Hallelujah. And this uncircumcised Philistine don't hold no candle to a bear or a lion. And the God that delivered me from them will deliver me from him. Does anybody serve a deliverer? Well, if he's delivered you once, then he can deliver you now. Don't be a prisoner to what's troubling you. You have a deliverer. Declare your anointing. And so the Philistine in verse number 42, uh, well, look, he speaks to his giant. Let me say this in verse number 46. He says, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and to the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there's a God in heaven. Hallelujah. Amen. The giant tried to talk David into defeat, but David replied to sender and told him, you tell me you're going to feed me to the birds, I'm going to feed you and your whole army to the birds. Praise God. David spoke and revealed 
prophetically of the giant's demise. When you don't know what else to say to the devil, remind him of his future. He has no control over the chain that's going to bind him and cast him into the lake of fire that burns forever. That's going to happen. He don't want to hear it, so you need to say it. Oh, hallelujah. Read. David spoke and revealed the giant's demise, and then David spoke of outcomes for which he had no tools to achieve. He said, I'm going to knock you down and cut off your head. David didn't even have a pocket knife on him. How can you speak of cutting the head of a giant off when you don't even have a sword? Verse 50, but there was no sword in the hand of David. You don't need a sword in your hand if you got a sword in your mouth. My God. Because if you speak the sword of the word of God, Jehovah Jireh will show up. You know who Jehovah Jireh is? The Lord will provide. Hallelujah. Amen. If you need a knife, he's a knife giver. If you need a rope, he'll pull you out of the pit. If you need a, a sunshine, he'll send it your way. If you need the rain to come, he's the God of the rain. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Oh, hallelujah. And so Saul wants to know whose son are you. He was the son of Jesse, but he was a whole lot more than that. He was a child of the anointing. Yes, hallelujah. And God doesn't anoint people for nothing. That's right. I think we forget that, but hell remembers it. When God anoints, he anoints with a goal in mind. Every anointed Holy Ghost filled Jesus' name, baptized, tongue-talking child of God has been anointed for a destiny. And he'll try to reclassify you if you let him. Just like he tried to reclassify David as just a son of an unknown guy out in the land of Bethlehem. A son of a nobody. I'll tell you what I'll do, David. You come work for me. I'm going to make a musician out of you. Okay, tried to demote him, court musician. Here we go from giant slayer. Just because you're an anointed person doesn't mean the stair path is always up. Sometimes it's down. I mean, you're killing a giant one day. They're celebrating you in the streets as a war hero. The next minute, you're sitting, sitting there strumming your harp while servants feed Saul grapes to calm him down. And I got nothing against musicians. We love musicians. All of us wish we were musicians, probably secretly. But here he is. But when you're anointed for something, you can't defeat. Look, you can't stop an anointed man, even if you try to reclassify him as a musician. The next thing you know, he could kill giants with stones. He could cut heads off with swords. Or he could cast out spirits with harps. It doesn't matter. When you're anointed, everything you touch, uh, amen, can be used of the Holy Ghost. Uh, hallelujah. Come on, hallelujah. Come on, hallelujah. You can be an anointed school teacher and impart the presence and word of God to somebody's mind and spirit. You can be an anointed factory worker and inspire the people down the line to think about the things of God. You can be an anointed mama and tell stories to that little infant that you think barely understands a word you're saying, but oh, they're taking it in. Hallelujah. You can be an anointed retired person that ha doesn't have the strength that you had when you were 30 or 40 or 50, but now maybe you're 70 or 80 or 90, but that doesn't mean there isn't power, amen, in your, in your, in your experience and in the voice of counsel. Come on, somebody. You can't take the future Hell doesn't have the power to take your destiny away from you if you don't let him. Whew. David 
David was cast as a musician, he still cast out devils. David was chased into the land of Gad, Gath, and they detected that he was there. And David deceived his attacker by pretending to be a crazy man and got the victory. <laughs> Have you ever lived long enough to see God bless your craziness? Have you ever done something stupid or acted in such a way that didn't make much sense, but somehow God not only didn't strike you down for it, somehow he turned it to your favor and good? Come on, somebody. Have you never had God bless your mistakes? I've seen him bless mistakes. Sometimes I'm preaching and I think it's one big mistake and someone will come up to me and say, that message changed my life. I think, oh God, your message to me just changed my life. So Saul will try to imitate you through family spirits. I know what I'll do. I'll marry into my daughter. That'll take care of him. That'll kill his spirit. So David now is a son-in-law of Saul, among, among other things. And the Ark of the Covenant's coming back to Israel. It's been long gone for many years. David's excited. Every six paces, they're sacrificing something. The instruments are playing. The praise is going on. David's dancing before the Lord. And here comes his wife, Saul's daughter, Michael. And she looks out the window, and she insults the king in front of God and everybody. Some fine specimen of royalty you are today. Prince Charles, you're not, David. He'd never get out there in his bathrobe and jump around like you're doing and David wouldn't allow. When you try to hinder the worship of an anointed person, all it's like pouring gasoline on a fire. He said, you thought that was bad, girl? Wait till you see this. You have never. I, I plan to be more undignified today than you've ever seen me before because this presence of God that we're celebrating is on its way home, and I got something to shout about. You can't stop the worship of an anointed man or woman. Hallelujah. It just burns. And so when the devil wants you to focus on your limitations and on your failures, and he wants to refocus your attention on what you're not or where you came from or who your family, who your kinfolk are, why you shouldn't be have victory, you need to speak up and declare it. I am an anointed son of Jesse. Not just a son of Jesse, I'm an anointed son of Jesse. Declare your royal roots. I, we're children of Azusa Street. We got the fire like they did back then. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one place and in one accord. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were seated. And there appeared cloven tongues like as a fire and it sat upon each of them and it sat upon me I'll never forget the day that God filled me with the Holy Ghost some say it would wear off some said it was just a teenage phase some said I might be losing my mind uh, uh, I lost my flesh and found Jesus and I'm gonna tell you something I am anointed today uh, 45 years later, I still feel the power. Would you stand? Do we have any anointed sons? Do we have any anointed daughters? I want you to declare it. I, amen. I began with this anointing, and I'm going to end with this anointing. And hell, you're not going to stop me from slaying the giants that come against me because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. He's in this place. He's in this place. He's here to do a work. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Okay, so now I want you to think about what your problem is. If you're sick, you need to shout, declare, I'm healed. If you're bound, you need to say, I'm free. If you feel like you're poor and broke, you need to say, I'm rich. If you feel all alone, you need to say, I got more friends than I know what to do with.